Hi everyone, my name is Samir. Um, I am the Director of Webinars and Seminars for Comsa. Uh, I'll be presenting for you guys today. We originally had another presenter, but in, uh, due to some technical issues, we had to change at the last minute, which is why uh, we had to delay it a little bit, and I'm sorry for that if it uh, caused any inconvenience. Um, so I'll be going through the presentation today myself, and then I'll be doing some FAQs as well, I'll try to do my best to answer all your questions. All you have to do is type them into the the right hand side of this uh, YouTube page um, and I will see them after the webinar. I can't see them while I'm presenting or I won't be looking at them specifically and then I'll uh, go through them. If you have any questions you can type them in, in there and I'll try my best to get through them. Uh, so without further ado, let's begin this webinar. Just give me one moment to uh, get it up here. Perfect. So, osteopathic medicine in Canada, this is presented by the uh, COMSA, for those of you who don't. Um, yeah, COMSA is the uh, Canadian Osteopathic Medical Student Association. You, We have a Facebook group. If you don't know about it right now, the address is right there. Do go join us. We also have a group for pre-med students. Um, you can look that up as well and also find that link down in the description below. And we also have a website we recently updated, uh, studentdo.ca. Do go there. Um, if you're thinking of applying, there's a lot of great resources for you. And also, if you have any questions, there are lots of, uh, there's lots of information that we've accumulated and put onto the website over the years. Um, so let's go on to the next page here. So a lot of you might be wondering, what, what is a DO? It kind of sounds like optometry or chiropractic, you, you're not really sure what it is. Well, DO is uh, equivalent to an MD. It's a professional degree uh, at, at the doctorate level, and it stands for, as you can see there, the Doctor of Osteopathic Medicine. Um, in the US and in North America and many countries worldwide, um, the DO, the Doctor of Osteopathic Medicine, is the professional equivalent uh, and is a fully licensed physician as an MD. They practice the full scope of medicine and in all surgical specialties. They can become any, they can do a residency um, and do any kind of medicine that an MD can do. There are literally professionally, there are no distinctions between them. Um, the only difference is that during medical school, um, they go additional, they undergo additional training in manual medicine, what's called osteopathic manual medicine, and therefore OMM. And these are typically these night classes or uh, classes in the evening that you take um, a couple, few times a week for the first two years of school, um, and you get, you become uh, proficient in osteopathic manipulation. And that is essentially the, the most, the biggest difference in terms of the curriculum uh, between the DO and the MD uh, approaches. Uh, the second is a, a philosophical approach, uh, a, a philosophical difference. And DOs really believe in a holistic approach, which means that we try to take care of the patient as a whole instead of uh, just a part. So for example, if a person comes in with a, spe a specific illness, rather than targeting that illness and trying to stabilize that, we, we think we listen to the patient and we try to take care of their problem uh, with respect to the entire individual and their entire story. So it's a humanistic approach to medicine. Um, although that is, you know, uh, that philosophy is now also um, you know, bleeding on to our MD colleagues as well. So, you know, that difference is eroding a little bit more, but it's still uh, somewhat uh, prominent among DOs. Oh, I just was just re speaking about that, going on to the osteopathic philosophy. So, uh, osteopathic medicine was founded um, in the late 1980s, sorry, 1800s, uh, late 1800s by an MD by the name of Dr. A.T. Still. Um, and he wanted to focus, he wanted to shift the focus of, of health, medical care at the time from really being disease centric to being overall health centric. Um, you know, so disease can be something physical, whereas health uh, can be psychosocial, mental, um, behavioral, spiritual, um, and, and, and encompasses the disease portion of it. So there are four tenets of osteopathic medicine. Um, and you can see them there. The human being is a dynamic unit of function, which means that you know we are we are always changing and adapting our body. And when we say human being, we're referring to the body, but also our physical and psychosocial mind. Um, 
and that the body possesses a self-regulatory mechanisms which are self-healing in nature. Um, and so essentially the osteopathic philosophy uh, through OMM believes that if you if you help the body to position itself in the most optimal way that it can uh, that you can facilitate uh, the, the body's healing on its own um, and it can solve a lot of problems uh, structure and function are interrelated at all levels um, and that the rational treatment is always based is based on all these principles uh, so Essentially, we try to, the osteopathic medicine philosophy will try to rely less on medications and, and uh, surgical procedures if, and try to do the more conservative humanistic therapy before uh, we go to the other aspects of it. So osteopathic medicine is, is the fastest growing segment of healthcare populations in the United States. Um, right now there are 30 colleges of osteopathic medicine and um, there are over 40 locations in, the, uh, in 28 states. Uh, 30 colleges and 40 locations because some colleges have more than one campus. Um, so for example, AT, um, sorry, the, the uh, Kirksville School also has SOMA. Uh, KCU is opening a second one in Joplin. Um, uh, PCOM has one in Georgia. Um, so there are some schools that have more than one, more than uh, one location. So more than 20% of the medical schools, uh, medical students in the U.S. are being trained uh, to be DOs at the at the moment, and this, as you can see, is expected to grow uh, to 25% by 2020. So the segment of uh, of medical professionals, the medic uh, the medical doctors. Um, in the U.S. that are that actually have a DO de degree is increasing, um, and therefore we hope that the awareness of DO also increases. So right now there are about 80,000 DOs practicing in the U.S., and again that number is expected to increase by 2020, as you can see, to 100,000. So uh, the doctor of osteo, this is a big. This is a very important slide because in Canada, we don't actually have any osteopathic medical schools, so to speak, but we do have um, uh, osteopathic schools. Um, you might be familiar with the Canadian Academy of Osteopathy in Hamilton, for example. Um, the difference between the traditional osteopath, what, which, those that you can find around in Canada, and the doctor of osteopathic medicine, um, which are the deals who graduate from medical schools, key, key term there, medical schools in the US, is that the DOMP, the Doctor of Manual Practice, doctor, doctor of Osteopathic Manual Practice, is only licensed to practice manual techniques, or so the manual is a, is just a purely manual practitioner. So it's not medical school. They don't, they can't do surgery. They're not a licensed physician. They cannot register to be licensed physicians um, anywhere else. So. They cannot prescribe medication or perform surgery. Um, education is completely different. So education required is um, to be an osteopathic manual practitioner is available in many other countries. However, you can only become a doctor of osteopathic medicine um, and a licensed physician in the U.S. right now. So, you know, there are some pro there are some osteopathic programs in Spain, but those are not medical schools, um, and they're similar to the one that we have in Hamilton. Um, and that's because when the philosophy first originated in the United States, it emanated into other countries as people traveled and took the philosophy overseas. However, they never really became full medical schools uh, like the ones in the U.S. did. Um, similarly, these, the DO, there are no traditional osteopathy schools in the U.S. anymore. Uh, they, you cannot be a DO in the U.S. and not be a physician. Um, all school, all deal schools in the U.S. will train you to be a medical uh, medical practitioner. So there you go. As uh, it says, only graduates from U.S. osteopathic osteopathic medical schools can call themselves physicians. Um, and uh, something I just wanted to add: uh, the U.S. osteopathic medical schools are also recognized by the Medical Council of Canada, the Royal College of Sur Physicians and Surgeons of Canada, and the College of Family Physicians of Canada, and at the at the provincial level as well. Um, College and Surgeons and Physicians of Ontario. Uh, you can go onto their website, the CPSO, and and find uh, legislation to that effect. So deals around the world. Um, deals are not quite as recognized yet 
as MDs are around the world, um, uh, but awareness is increasing. So right now we have the right, unlimited practice rights in about 60 countries and it's increasing all the time. Um, so they are recognized as physicians in those, one, in those countries and can practice. However, like I said before, osteopaths who went to osteopathy school outside the United States are not eligible for licensure in those countries. Um, in the UK, for example, uh, students can take osteopathy there, but they are not physicians. However, U.S. trained osteopathic physicians can go to the U.S. Uh, so can go to the U.K. and register to be a uh, licensed physician. So U.S. trained deals have full practice rights in Canada as well. Here is a map where you can see. Um, so those countries in purple are the one the countries that do allow American DOs to come in, but do not give them the right to practice medicine. They are allowed to do uh, manual manipulation, but they can't actually practice um, full medicine, the full scope of medicine. And the ones in the orange are the ones that um, we do have, uh, you know, practice rights with at least one physician being there. Um, and then the gray ones, we are not. We don't, we don't know what their stance is yet. So this is something you want to look into because if you uh, have a plan to go overseas and practice overseas, you want, to, you want to make sure that the country that you may want to settle in in the future will recognize your degree and your practice rights. So uh, look into this and um, you know this, this map may not be the most up to date, uh, I will say. If you have more questions, you can always um, um, email or call AACOM, the American Academy uh, College of Osteopathic Medicine. Um, and they will hopefully be able to answer all your questions. Osteopathic.org is a website right there. So applying to osteopathic medical schools. It goes through the American Association of Colleges of Osteopathic Medicine application service. So AACOMAS, the website is right there. Applications this year have already begun. Um, the primary applications, they open uh, in May and can be submitted after June 1st. Um, you enter all your information. It's very similar to the applications you have in Canada. They'll take your grade, your MCAT scores, your volunteers. Um, they do. Most schools will require three three letters of recommendation, uh, two letters from a science uh, basic your prerequisite science professors, and at least one from a physician. Um, the letters of rec recommendation requirements are done at the school level, not at the application level. So it's not AACOM, uh, AACOM as I should say that is telling you which letter of recommendation you need. It's the school specifically um, that states which letter of recommendation you need. So make sure you uh, get in touch with each school, look through their website, uh, and to find out exactly what kind of letters of recommendation you need. Um, and of course, the personal statement. That is pretty general. It will You will put it into a, 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 your application pro portal, and it will go out to all the schools at once. Um, once you submit your app and you have sent your transcripts in, AA Comas will uh, process your file and verify that all the grades you entered are exactly as they are on your transcripts um, and that the course the descriptions are the same, not the descriptions, but the titles are the same, etc. Um, once the school has received your, your file, uh, your application, it will look through it to make sure that you meet their minimum requirements. And if they're interested in your application, they will send you a secondary application. A lot of schools will send, uh, some schools will screen. So some schools actually look at your file um, and only send secondaries to the candidates that they are interested in. Um, and some schools do not screen. They will literally send a secondary to everybody who applies to them. Um, and the reason for that is secondary applications cost money. So uh, just be aware of that. Secondary applications, typically, they, um, they want the, you to answer more essay-style questions. Some of them will require you to retype all your extracurricular activities. Um, I know CECOM and, uh, and um, with as so CECOM and ASCOM will require you to upload a resume. Um, so you know, look into look into the secondaries, um, and also the the letters of recommendation should be in by now. So you will. It's always best to send them in as soon as possible because once they arrive, they will go through a processing of two to three weeks. Make sure that the letters of recommendation meet all their minimum requirements. For example, a signature letterhead. Um, course title that you took with that professor. So 
by that time, by the secondary application, you should have the letters of recommendation in. Now, once you send in your secondary application with the fee, um, they, will they will take two to three weeks to review it and decide whether they wish to offer you an interview. Now, this is a very important point here. DO applications and MD applications in the US are do not, don't work the same as they do in Canada, uh, where everybody applies by a certain date, everybody waits a certain day, uh, until a certain date to get an interview, and then you schedule your interviews. Um, in the US, it's a rolling system. So the earlier you apply, the earlier they see your application, and the earlier they can make a decision on your application. So it's best to apply as soon as you possibly can. Um, it's, the application for the season has already started. It started in May. We are into June now. Um, it, is, it is still early, um, so you want to apply as soon as possible. Schools can be a little bit more lenient with you um, as, as if you apply early, but as they start filling up the class, they become more selective for those remaining seats. So you really want to apply early. Uh, so uh, for your reference, here's a statistic from 2012. Uh, 2012 is a, kind of a, a long time ago, I would say. So you know these stats might be a little bit lower. Um, so these stats might be a little bit higher now. But as you can see, overall, all schools, deal schools, the average GPA is about 3.5. I mean, MCAT was about 27. So this is the old number. Um, you know, I expect it to be pretty much the same with the new MCAT in terms of uh, percentile. Um, MSU, which is the Michigan State University College of Osteopathic Medicine, one of the, uh, the first schools to start accepting Canadians um, and has many Canadians there. Their overall was a 3.6 um, GPA 28 MCAT, but the Canadian portion actually had a 3.65 GPA and a 29 MCAT. So as you can see, the Canadians are typically a little bit more competitive than the, their American counterparts, the, than the general American applicant pool. Um, and I believe that that's going to just going to start begin increasing as more and more Canadians apply for those seats, uh, specifically at M MSU, because it limits the number of Canadians uh, that can be admitted to, I believe, 20 or, or 25. 25, I believe. So here's the perspective timeline. Um, you, when you go to the US, you're going to start, you're going to get an F1 student visa. Uh, there will be two years of preclinical. Uh, education similar to everything is pretty much the same as an MD um, then there will be two your years three and four will be your rotations after which you will go into a residency when you finish school and you transition over to residency you will also transition from a student visa to a work visa and there are two options there the H1B or the J1 we'll go into more details about that later um, the big difference between medical education in the US and Canada really are these board exams as you can see uh, there is a step one board exam. This is the U.S. Medical Licensing Exam, or USMLE. You may have heard of that, the step one. It happens right at the end of your preclinical pre education, and but before you can start your rotations. Um, yes, uh, so essentially you will get a score on that, um, and it's a very important exam because it helps, it, it kind of limits you in terms of your performance on that will kind of determine what kind of residencies you are going to be competitive for. So, and it basically covers all the preclinical education you get in your first two years. Um, so there's that. And then um, during your third year, you will take the step two, um, or you can uh, step two exams. Sorry, one, one thing to mention, the step one board exams, uh, as DOs will take the USMLE is an MD exam. Uh, DOs can take the USMLE, and I highly recommend all Canadian DOs to take that exam. But uh, in order, the DOs schools will also require you to take their exam. It's called the Comlex, and I believe we have a slide on that later. Um, so again, in third year, you'll take the step two. But the Canadian exams are the ones in red, the MCCEE and the NACOSCE. Um, these, you also want to do these exams. It's very important if you wish to try and match back into Canada or just come back to Canada in general. We have to get those exams done. Uh, the MCCEE is, a, um, is an exam similar, is, uh, is a written exam, I believe, in the NACOSCE, I believe, is a um, practical. So, and then we have the Step 3 board exams. Your Step 3 is generally done in your first year of residency. Um, and then you would also write the MCCQE in Canada. There we go, the US licensing exam, COMLEX. So this is the Comprehensive Osteopathic Medical Licensing Exam. Um, COMLEX is the series of exams that 
uh, is equivalent to the USMLE. Uh, not exactly the same in terms of the question types and content, but um, COMLEX is the ones that all DO schools have to take, and then the USMLE is the one that MD students have to take. But like it says there, many DO students will take the USMLE as well, uh, just so that they have access to a little bit, a few more residency options. Um, res uh, program directors and residencies are far more familiar with USMLE than the COMLEX score, uh, specifically, especially the ones that grant visas to Canadians. So it's best if you do the USMLE. Um, for all Canadians should definitely try to do that. Um, so like it says there, both COMLEX and USMLE test the same basic sciences and COMLEX has an additional OMM section. So Canada no longer requires a USMLE or licensure, COMLEX will suffice. Um, although it does say that, I still highly, we all, it is still highly recommended that you do the USMLE simply for, um, like I said before, most program directors are not quite so familiar with the COMLEX. Um, they are much more comfortable looking and uh, comparing you with other students based on a USMLE step one score. So at least do the step one. Um, I think that's, uh, that will be important. So um, this basically dri uh, divides those uh, three, the US step one, step two, and step three, like we talked about. The uh, step one is taken right after your second year of medical school, it tests your basic science. Step two is taken between the third and fourth year of your med school. It's focused on your clinical medicine. Um, um, which, yeah, and then step three, which is taken right after in your first year for residency, and it's your final, uh, your final uh, part section of the USMLE, um, and it's your advanced clinical knowledge. And the COMLEX have the counterparts to each and every single one of those. So here we have it again, and you can see here when you take your step one, step two, and step three. So a little bit more information about visas here. Um, like I said before, all Canadian students who go into the US or any international student who goes to the US to study as, uh, will be on an F1 student visa. Um, your school sponsors it, they send you a form. However, you do need a financial proof uh, at the border when you go down the, you will be asked to provide financial proof um, that you can in fact support yourself and pay for your education um, while you are in the US. So keep, keep, keep that in mind. Typically, if you have a student line of credit, and uh, nowadays, because the dollar is quite low, you will need more than a st one student line of credit. Um, you might need some other source of funds. Together, you can, you can um, bring those together. Together, you can provide them enough funds to show your, the, the border that you have enough funds to cover your education. And then there is the J-1 visa and the H-1B visa. These are both work permits or work visas. Um, and essentially, these come kick in when you have to transition to these after you finish your school and you begin your residency. Uh, the J-1 visa is by far much easier to get than the H-1B. Uh, the reason is because um, J-1 does not count towards your, uh, your green card. So after the J-1, you must leave for two years after you complete your um, after you complete your training, you have to leave the United States for two years to your home country um, if, you have, if you are on the J-1. So for example, if you want to do uh, internal, uh, so let's say family medicine, uh, you transition to a J-1 and after you complete your family medicine training in the U.S., you are required to come back to Canada for two years before you can re-enter into the U.S. to work. So that's the big limitation on the J-1. Now, there is a waiver to that. So if you agree to practice in an underserved area, they can waive that return requirement. So there is a way to get around it. Um, again, it's just a little bit more work. Now, starting 2016, there has been a limit imposed on the J-1 visas being issued by Canada, and we're going to go into more detail into that a little bit later. Um, the H-1B visa is an excellent option as well, if that's what you wish to take. It essentially works um, in that <clears throat> the H-1B requires the step three to be complete. However, uh, most international students can't do, can't do that uh, because they can't have the step three complete before they graduate because it's supposed to be done a year into your residency. Canadian students have the option, the benefit, of transferring the F1, extending the F1 called an OPT extension. 
Um, and what they do is they complete, they, they make an agreement with the hospital that there will be an H1, that the hospital will sponsor an H1B visa for you instead of a, a J1. And again, by doing this, you've completely removed Canada out of the equation. There's no limits. Um, and then what happens is you do your first year of residency in the, on the OPT extension. You write your step three, and then you transition onto the H-1B visa in your second year. Um, so we don't have to take a year off like those Caribbean grads who have to take a year off in order to pass that step three. And the best part of it is that there's no return requirement. So you can stay in the U.S. and work there after the completion of your residency. And that time is counting towards the residency time that you can use to apply for a green card later on. So that's the uh, J-1 versus the H-1B. So like I said, I would mention, uh, go into a little bit more detail about the limitations on J-1 visas. Um, you can see here that family medicine and internal medicine are really the, um, the, the most prominent options for Canadians. However, TBC, um, you know, there is a um, decrease anticipated in both. Um, so as you can see in 2015, there were 183 issued. There were, and however, there was a limit. This year, there will be a limit of 295. But internal medicine is, uh, as you can see, 196 issued in a, and a limit of 200. Um, and there, there isn't, there isn't a lot of. There aren't a lot of J1s in all the other specialties. So, so primary care, really, family medicine and internal medicine are going to be your, re, uh, your, uh, your more the easiest options for you. Um, and internal medicine after which you, you will have, if you're on the J1, you will also have to take care of the J1 when you um, decide to specialize, uh, do a subspecialty, like for example, gastrointestinal medicine. There's a lot more detail to this. You can always go onto the Canada Health website, um, Health Canada website, and look into this a little bit more. Oh, one thing I did wait, want to mention is that J1s are, are on a first come first serve basis. So, um, once you find out where you match, do you want to apply for as soon as you possibly can um, to get a J-1? And we are competing for J-1 from all international Canadian uh, graduates. It's not just a deal thing. Um, so the Caribbean grads who are, are also applying for J-1 in order to be able to work in the U.S. So, or, at, or any really any Canadian that wants to do residency in the U.S. that is not an American resident needs to have will compete with we with uh, they will all everybody will complete compete for the j1 visa so again uh, like i said once your first once your school is finished your your four years of medical school is, are finished you will transition from the f1 student visa to one of either the h1b or the j1 and we went over the uh, the advantages and uh, the limitations of both um, earlier on so now let's talk a little bit more about residencies. There are three options for Canadian DOs. Uh, CARNS is the Canadian, uh, uh, the Canadian Residency Matching Service. Um, ACGME is the US MD residencies right now. Um, it's going to be osteopathic as well, but we'll talk about that a little bit more later. Right now, AOA is the, uh, the American Osteopathic Association governs the US DO residencies so right now and this won't be the case for you but right now there are three streams available um, if you're watching the stream and you haven't applied yet or haven't started yet by the time you graduate there will only be CARMS and ACGME as there has been a merger between the ACGME and the AOA but again I'll go into the more details about that so first let's talk about CARMS um, we are considered international medical graduates uh, by the the CARMS matching service, um, and we can so we and we can practice uh, we can uh, enter the IMG iteration in Ontario, British Columbia, Quebec, Alberta, and Manitoba. So the IMG match rates are not the greatest um, in Ontario. Overall, in Canada, it's a twenty percent match uh, overall. So it's it the it's not the greatest. In uh, twenty thirteen, for example, we had two deals match, uh, one to family medicine and U of T and one at McMaster. Um, there, are, there are others as well, um, but for some reason they're not on the slide. So, um, Elective rotations during your third and fourth year. So essentially, 
when you want to try and match to a specific hospital or in Canada, it's best uh, if you have some exposure to the Canadian uh, to Canadian rotations. So in your third and fourth year, most more likely in your fourth year, you do have the option of scheduling elective rotations in Canada. Typically, it works on a lottery based system. Um, so it's very competitive, it's hard to get, but if you can, it's a good opportunity to, to try and get a letter of recommendation from a Canadian hospital or Canadian physician, and it will make your application for CARMS a little bit stronger. Having said that, because given, given that the match rates are very low, it might pass and um, it might be better if you just, you know, forego that and try to maximize your options in the US instead. So optimizing your application, for CARMS, really, you have to make sure you pass the MCZE and the Nakalski. We talked about that. That's going to that's around in your between your third and fourth year of medical school, and you also really want to have amazing letters of recommendation, uh, very strong letters of recommendation from the physicians that you rotate with. So the American MD match, called the ACGME match, it consists of MDs, DOs, Canadian MDs, and IMGs. Uh, meaning that all these segments can apply to the ACGME match. Um, it's not just limited to MDs. Every, everybody can apply. There will be Canadian, uh, uh, Canadian MDs. There will be Caribbean MDs. There will be US DOs. There will be Australian doctors, um, doctors from Asian countries, doctors from the UK, basically everywhere uh, who will be applying to the ACGME uh, MD match. Um, the most important really the, is the step one score, the USMLE step one score and step two score as well. Um, this will determine what, what kind of specialization or residency type you are competitive for. So the average scores for primary care however, are lower than, and the, the special, if you want to do a specialization, um, there's something called ROADS, uh, I think it's radiology, ophthalmology, anesthesiology, dermatology, these are very competitive, so you will need much higher step one and step two scores to be competitive for that. And of course, like any application system, you also need strong letters of recommendations. Um, yeah, so a lot, many DOs actually apply to both the AOA and the ACGME uh, programs, and some, 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 uh, some, some residencies are actually duly accredited. They're both AOA residencies and ACGME. They're accredited by both agencies. Um, and it's, it's, it's best if you apply to both because Health Canada will only give a J1 to, for ACGME residencies. They will not give a visa for AOA residencies. That will not be an issue for you. Um, if you haven't started yet, it won't be, it most likely will not be an issue for you. Um, stay on top of that though. Things can change anytime. It's unpredictable what Health Canada will do. So make sure you stay on top of that. Uh, MSUCOM is affiliated, which is the Michigan State College of Osteopathic Medicine, is affiliated with a number of duly accredited programs. So like, we, like I said earlier, the, the ACGME is really the best match. Um, and that's because A, it's the, uh, we have the greatest success this, this past year. We had 100% of students, 100% of the Canadian DOs matched um into a residency uh, many of them did the acgme the md residency um, and you need to do that because you will be able to get a j1 visa um with the md match now here are some important highlights we are considered as a us deal we are not considered an img we are an american medical graduate um and therefore this increases the likelihood of obtaining interview invites significantly um, Let's compare that to Caribbean grads. Caribbean MD students are considered international medical graduates, and therefore they actually have a much tougher time getting interview invites. We don't. Canadian DOs are considered AMGs and therefore have a much easier time securing interviews. Um, so yeah, essentially, and uh, there's a many better visa offerings as well. For example, the H1B. The reason we can do that is because we can do the F uh, the OPT extension. And, and not have to get these step three in uh, in time. So this is the AOA match, the American DO match. Uh, currently, um, many of the DO graduates will pursue an AOA accredited residency. However, those residencies typically uh, actually are not, they're not accredited in the US. So, sorry, in Canada. You can't you do an AOA accredited residency and practice in Canada. Now, again, like I said, 
for most of you, this won't matter because the AOA and the ACGME are merging, uh, like it says down there. And so all AOA will be accredited by ACGME by the, after 2020. So if you're starting school next year, you won't graduate till 2021. So for you, it won't be an issue. Um, there we go. Only DO graduates are eligible. So the AOA is an exclusive match, which means that MD and only the DO medical students can apply. Uh, MD medical students, regardless of whether they're from Canada, the US, or IMGs, cannot apply for the AOA. Um, however, when the merger happens, then those residency spots will be open to everybody else. So there's, there's, uh, it's debatable whether this is good for us or bad for us. Um, this is just something that we have to kind of roll on with. So here are some match statistics for you. As you can see, 66% um, of uh, medical grad. so the best strategy is to, to try and match in, in, um, in the, the, MD, the ACGME. As you can see, only 20% of IMGs match in Canada. So this slide is actually a little bit out of date. So it's not 66% of USMDs and DOs. Uh, because deals are considered IMGs. This, like I said, this only happened in 2016. So USMDs have a 66% chance of matching to Canada. However, deals only have a 20% chance. That's what this slide should say. And that's because USMDs are considered Canadian medical graduates, um, or at least they're classified as Canadian medical graduates. Um, and that has to do with the difference in um, accreditation for other schools. Um, LCME versus AOA. So the best strategies, because, because we only have a 20% chance of matching back into Canada, the best strategy, uh, if you're a Canadian DO, is to pursue a residency in the United States. Uh, because you can see, the, look, have a look at those numbers. Um, osteopathic med schools over here, it says 77%. This is a little bit out of date, 2014. This year, it was... Uh, it was, it was much higher than that. It was close to like 84, 83, I believe. And it's increasing every year. If you compare that to Canadian medical graduates who apply to the US for residency, you can see it's only 43%. Even worse, if you go to the Caribbean MD school, you will have a chance of matching 49.5. So if you are considering Caribbean medical school versus a US DO school, just look at those numbers. Uh, just looking at 2014, for example, 49.5% chance of matching into a residency versus 77.7% .7 matching into a residency. You can already see that it's much better uh, to be an osteopathic medical student. Um, you have a, you'll have a much easier time matching. MD, and uh, MD students, of course, have a 94%. Now, after the merger, then... I believe this number, again, the 77, is going to be much, much higher. I believe it will be in the 90s because then all the osteopathic med school students will have to match to an ACGME. Um, and you must have at least a 96% match rate uh, for the school without, if, if you don't, then the, the, uh, the accredited agency, you know, the tr school will get in trouble with the accrediting agency. So the 77% is right now for the AOA match. When the ACGME and the AOA match all together come into the ACGME, then you can expect numbers similar to that 95 percent that you see for allopathic schools will also be for osteopathic schools. So if you consider ninety-five versus fifty percent for the for the Caribbean grads, it just makes the picture even better for us uh, as U.S. DO students. So um, I made reference to this a little bit earlier. This is the, uh, the Canadian DO match this year. As you can see, some students decided to go with the AOA match. Um, and the NRMP, that's the ACGME match. So you can see there were 13 students in the AOA. Uh, most of these uh, most likely did an H-1B visa. Um, yeah, it looks like mo anybody who did the, or the dually accredited, by the way. So sorry, this number, these also numbers also include the dual accredited. If you do a dual accredited, you can go for the J-1 because... Uh, um, it's an ACGME accredited residency, and so you can use that. Uh, and we had one student match into family medicine in Canada. Uh, if you look at the breakdown by specialty, you'll see that family medicine and internal medicine are the, really the two um, that dominated, and that just goes because 
um, DOs are typically um, most open to primary care. So primary care residencies are typically the most open to DO students. Um, how having said that, um, if you work hard and you're focused and you have a good resume, you can definitely do, <clears throat> sorry about that, you can definitely take on radiation oncology, psychiatry, anesthesiology, you know, the world is your oyster. You just have to make sure you work hard for it, right? So, <clears throat> like I said before, in order to get an F1 visa, you do have to show financial proof. So, and your schools are right now a little uh, quite expensive, uh, given that the Canadian dollar is a little bit lower. Um, OSAP will provide some assistance for you, about ten thousand dollars a year. Um, you will so if you're and and then a student aid BC works as well. Um, the estimated cost of attendance there it says it's around three hundred thousand. I would say it's close to four hundred now, with that the Canadian dollar has fallen. It's not at par anymore, um, and Canadian deal school, sorry, American deal schools are eligible uh, for the student lines of credits, the professional student lines of credits uh, for medical students at many, uh, most of the major banks. Um, and you can see that there's a difference in the amount of money that um, they give. So CIBC is typically the best, the best option um, for American DOs, Canadian DO students right now because they offer the most amount of money. I believe BMO is uh, 150, not 250. Uh, uh, 150,000, um, or maybe that's, uh, sorry, that's RBC. RBC is 150,000. So shop around, make sure you talk to, uh, make sure you talk to all the banks and not just one, and uh, make the best decision for yourself. So I refer to this as well. MSUCOM was one of the first schools um, that started accepting uh, can, uh, Canadians and each year they have a program they have an initiative so to speak that accepts 20 to 25 qualified Canadian students a year um, typically the out-of-state student uh, to out-of-state tuition for uh, MSU com is 80,000 however Canadians will get a scholarship um, that reduces it by 20,000 so you get $80,000 scholarship and so it's essentially around $60,000 that you have to pay for your tuition. Still a little bit more expensive than other schools, uh, so make sure you're aware of that. However, MSUCOM is an excellent school. It was ranked ninth in the US for primary care in 2014. I believe it's ranked somewhere between 11 and 12 right now. And there are many Canadians, as you can see in 2015, there were 15, in 2016, there are 20. Uh, for the 2017 class, they have 22, and the ones graduating in 2018, there are 22 students. So. There are many students, there are many Canadians. Um, I think those, um, those are pretty much the highest numbers I think you will find in a DO school uh, as for Canadian students. So here's a picture. Um, you might recognize some of them. Yeah, you might be able to recognize some of them here. So, all right. So the Canadian osteopathic medical students. Um, a number of the Canadian DOs in the U.S., uh, there are many Canadian DOs in the U.S. As you can see here, each year the number of Canadian DOs graduating from U.S. schools is increasing. In 2009, there were only Canadian, um, there were only 13 students who, who went into Canadian, sorry, in 2009, there were only 13 Canadians who started DO school in the U.S. By 2013, that number was up to 58, and we believe that number is increasing all, ever more. Some of the more prominent schools that accept Canadians are listed there. MSU is Michigan State University. Uni is uh, New England University, University of New England. KCU is Kansas City's University of Medicine and Bioscience. Um, a AZ, uh, AZ is uh, Arizona uh, College of Osteopathic Medicine, or ASCOM. Um, the equivalent of that is CECOM, which is in Chicago College of Osteopathic Medicine. NOVA uh, is NOVA, NOVA Southeastern University. That is in um, Fort Lauderdale, I believe. It's in uh, Florida. There's Turo. Uh, Turo has two campuses, Middletown and New, uh, New York, I believe. Um, both of them accept Canadians. There's Western U. That one is in California. Um, that accepts Canadians. LMU is in Tennessee. LMU DCOM and PCOM, I believe, is in uh, Philadelphia. Oh, and I and like I said before, they have a they have a um, campus in Georgia as well. So there's you know there's a growing number of applicants and matriculants to 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 DO school every year, um, and that's amazing for us. You can go and look at more information if you like at the link 
right at the bottom below, aacom.org slash data slash applicant matriculants. So you can see here some of those schools that I mentioned before and how much their tuition is. Um, and you can see whether it's a little bit lower stats or higher stats, so you can have a look. Um, it does say low stats for Nova Southeastern University. Having said that, I believe they're a little bit more um, to, they're a little bit more strict with Canadian applicants. So it's not quite as it's not quite low. I would say it's a little bit average or better. Uh, however, take note that Turo, ASCOM, and CECOM, they're quite MCAT heavy. So ASCOM and CECOM most likely won't uh, interview you uh, for the old score. It was a thirty. I'm not sure what the new score. But they won't interview you in the early stages if you don't have an MCAT uh, at 30 or above. And similar to Turo, in fact, uh, Turo, I think, is inching towards a 31 MCAT average for the class, which is, uh, which is similar to, which is almost, sorry, the equivalent of uh, many Canadian, sorry, uh, many US MD schools. So. So for more information, you can always uh, go to these websites. Uh, like I said, we have a Facebook group uh, for the Canadian DOs, and also we also have a pre-med one on Facebook, so do look into that. Um, also, subscribe and like this, uh, comment on this YouTube channel if, if you like. If you want to see more videos like this or more, get more information, participate. Uh, definitely subscribe and uh, stay up to date. Michigan State University has a uh, University College of Osteopathic Medicine. You can visit them. Um, to find out a little bit more about osteopathic medicine if you like or just about applying or about that in a Canadian initiative program. Studentdo.ca is the website for the, uh, the Canadian Osteopathic Medical Student Association. Uh, that's us. That's, um, that's uh, basically the organization that's running this presentation right now um, and helps to uh, lobby on your behalf as a student. Um, there is a, a, a Canadian Osteopathic Association, so there are many DOs that are practicing in Canada right now. They have an association. It's called. It, you can visit that at osteopathic.ca, and the equivalent of that, the, the much larger one, is the American Osteopathic Association, and you can visit their site at osteopathic.org.